All right, uh, this is the last PulpCon session, and uh, this is the, uh, we're gonna talk about a few miscellaneous topics, um, three of them in particular, and then we will have the closing ceremonies brought to you by Rebecca Black and Friday. Uh, the Ubuntu support in the installer uh, is our first topic, and then we're gonna talk about caching related to downtime discussions earlier, and then if there is still time releasing, why releases without a delay for manual testing. And I'll put a link to the agenda here. Uh, this is a reuse of our miscellaneous topics um, conversation. And what we're gonna do is pick up at line 80. And I will try to um, provide some sort of time checking along the way that we, we can make sure to get through all projects. Um, I also want to, just before we get into our first topic, which is Ubuntu support in the installer, so whoever is the lead to discuss that, um, give it some thought to be ready. Um, just before we get into that, since this is our closing session, I want to call out now, and I'll do it again later, um, there is a HackMD for retrospectives on this event for the whole week. I'll put that link down here into the chat as well. So um, uh, if you have... Um, thoughts or grievances to air, as we sometimes say, uh, about the format or how this served or didn't serve your expectations or needs or what you'd like to see done similarly or differently or really any feedback at all, go ahead and put it on that um, HackMD, preferably today before we forget about it. And I'll bring this up again at the end of the call. So with that, let's move into uh, our first miscellaneous topic, which is Ubuntu support and the installer. Who would like to begin talking about that. I see Mike's hand. Mike, take it away. Yep. Uh, so, so yeah, as, uh, as I've maintained the installer over the last year and a half or so, I've noticed that it looks like in the past we had Ubuntu support, but we've just like silently left that uh, the code path, or even not so much code path, but just variables like rot. Um, um, and uh, I, there's a strong justification for it that, you know, Ubuntu does have very large market share. Looks like in the web hosting market, it's like 38%. And uh, having, you know, worked at or talked to other organizations in the past, some sh some organizations, some sites, some shops are entirely just Ubuntu based. It is their standard OS, which means that if they, they don't want to install another OS in order to, for one server, they want to just keep everything on the same server OS. That's a common customer desirement or requirement. Um, yep. Uh, so the, I've noticed, you know, we do currently support Debian 10, uh, thanks to, partially thanks to Matthias and other, uh, other developers and Ubuntu 2004 is released a little bit later. So if Debian 10 has dependencies, Ubuntu should have the dependencies we need as well. And that's why I estimate it'll be, uh, you know, it'll be well to, it'll be easy to implement. It'll be just another, uh, OS that's tested concurrently during the pulp installer CI. That's cool. So I made the assumption that since we are supporting Debian 10, that we're supporting Ubuntu. And that was a bad assumption. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like we actually have to like, we can simlink the variables and we'll probably have to do one or two more variable, three or four more variable changes or specific tasks. Yep. But by default, if it's not gonna support Ubuntu as is. Some links to the variable files, I'm yeah. I'm all for this. So is the, the issues that are noted here with uh, support for pulp RPM on when you're running pulp on Ubuntu, um, do we need to Not flatten them? Do we need to flat? Well, I mean, it's possible. It's just code, right? Um, <laughs> do we need to flatten them before we do this? And I'm hearing that the answer to that is a firm no, but I want to ask that explicitly. Is it okay to say... We support Ubuntu in the installer, and you can support all these different content types, but Pulp RPM isn't gonna work because it relies on binary packages that don't work or don't work correctly under Ubuntu. Yep, and I think that's okay because we yeah. do have Debian support uh, already where you can install it on a Debian 10 system. And we provide a, you know, a Ubuntu and Debian content type plugin uh, that, uh, is able to provide, you know, support for those systems. So I think 
users that want to install on Ubuntu probably are most interested in the Debian plugin anyway. Right, and we have the same exact limitation with Debian systems. The, the Debian yep. systems kind of have Pulp RPM installed on them. Right. Um, I, I would like us to, to try and fix that problem because where you're running your Pulp server may have nothing to do with the kinds of clients you're trying to serve. Definitely. That you're trying to get content to. So uh, as long as we don't, we don't forget about this would be really good, a really good gap to close. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is a great idea for all the reasons that Mike lists here. Yep, you're right. It is the content type that is correlated with the OS's package man for manager. Like, you know, I'm at a I'm at a company where Ubuntu is the official standard. Yep. Uh, cool. Um, any thoughts from Matthias? Since he did a lot of work on our Debian support. He did work on our Debian support and Pulp Deb. Yeah, well, it's a stretch to say if we support Debian, it's easy to support Ubuntu, but we should still pursue that. Right. Great. OK, that sounds like we're all in agreement then. Awesome. They'll be added to the Pulp installer uh, you know, uh, agenda. Sounds good, Mike. Great. Um, OK, all right. Well, thank you for that discussion. Our next topic is caching related. It says here, uh, starts at line 88 on the uh, miscellaneous agenda. It says, related to downtime discussions, really needs. Um, who would like to speak to this item? So I, I put this up here. Um, so uh, basically, we don't have much testing a pulp under high load of content consumption, um, which means thousands of clients downloading content. Um, we have a lot of a lot of tests of like uh, testing pulp under like sync load and publish like tasking, um, but not so much on the consumption side on the content app side, um, and that worries me um, because. Our content app makes uh, at minimum one, but actually it's several database queries per request. Um, so if you imagine, you know, a couple thousand or maybe fifteen thousand clients making requests for, I don't know, fifty packages or a smaller number of machines making requests for a lot of packages, like a kickstart install. Um, that adds up very, very quickly. Um, it expands to millions of small database queries potentially. Um, and I'm worried that our content app is going to be a bottleneck. Um, and it's one that we have no insight into, uh, at what threshold it might become a problem. Um, and we haven't really tested this because it's hard to test. It's, it's really hard to test something like this, uh, with like realistic load conditions, um, just by the nature, like we don't have 15,000 clients lying around. Um, but I think we need to do something to, uh, first of all, know if we have a problem here. Um, and I think there's at least a, a moderate likelihood that we will. And if we do, um, then we need to come up with a way to address it. And uh, the way it's related to the downtime discussion um, is, you know, obviously if our content app is down, then um, no other clients can get content. Um, and Rui had kind of the same concern where they wanted, they wanted something on uh, like, kind of like Simlinks, like Pulp2, um, where uh, Nginx could keep serving content uh, and metadata from the directories, without um, even if even if the content app is down. Um, and that's where that kind of ties in.
Right, and having talked to some organizations like conferences, they want something like that too. And uh, <clears throat> are we trying to focus this discussion on technologies such as Squid or Varnish, or are we talking about uh, actual functionality within Pulp that's going to provide this caching? So what I learned from the Ruiz folks testing is a couple of things, and I'll start with the answer to that question. Um, I, we need, we likely cannot rely on any technology that uses in-memory caching. So I think, based on my understanding, that puts technologies like Squid off the table. Um, I believe that also puts technologies like Memcache and Varnish off the table. Yep. Um, which uh i think leads me to a conclusion that uh we will need to offer some sort of feature set pulps feature set that will provide uh a scalable efficient um cache like um edge serving and i i use this term edge um because you know, even in, in Rui, for example, they have a distinction between the, sent, the one type of node that you run as your primary and then another type of node that you run as your on the edge. And I'll also call out that Artifactory has the same thing. Artifactory has two different types of nodes, and some of them are edge nodes, for primarily for the big content-facing, client-facing um, part of the delivery. So anyways. Uh, I would love to use one of those technologies because I always believe it's better to let a project dedicated to it do it. But unless it can do it on disk, I don't know how we'll do that. Um, may I ask what type of caching this is? I mean, are we talking about caching the HTTP requests here or would it work to cache the database accesses? Well, that's a good so question. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm making no proposal. I am raising uh, awareness that we need to look. First, we need to know how big of a problem do we have here? Like, at what point, um, like, are, are we going to fall over at 2,000 requests? Or are we going to, or 2,000 clients? Or are we going to fall over at 20,000 clients? Um, well, also, in, is there's a, it's there's a difference between if we if we fall over, no matter how many clients are hitting us, if we just fall over, that's a problem we have to solve because you can't fall over. What you can do is have a bunch of those clients time out because they never get a response. The server has to keep processing. So I'd like to, to separate those as two different issues. So, um, so I don't. I'd also like to separate an issue here. Um, so on the. One of the questions is, you know, do we have an architectural problem? And and let me just also preface this with saying, Daniel, I agree with you completely. Um, it's in the interest of serving a solution to this problem that I'm trying to pick it apart. Um, it's one thing to say we uh, have an architectural problem and you cannot continue to scale pulp to serve a client load at a certain size. Um, it's another thing to say we have an architectural problem that has a latency problem. One's a throughput problem, and the other is a latency problem. Um, and the latency problem would sound more akin to um, clients cannot receive their content fast enough relative to their expectations or other systems or something like that. Um, I don't believe we have the former that is a throughput problem because most of these operations are read operations, and so uh, you can deploy more web services, you can deploy more content apps, you can deploy more database nodes behind your Postgres installation. Um, and so I, I don't think we have an architectural issue that would prevent throughput. I think the kind of not great part about the throughput problem is it's financially expensive. Um, at some point, once your architecture allows never ending scaling, what you realize is that the problem isn't that you can't scale it, it's that you can't afford to. Um, and so I do believe that in the throughput area, we need to look at making our code more efficient um, some way or another. So I, I think there is a there there. But what I heard from the Rui team was different. I actually think that the main problem that they're purporting uh, and experiencing, which I agree with, um, is a real thing. 
is latency. Their observation was that uh, without a caching layer, your RPM repo update for a single client, not a lot of them, a single one, latency, uh, is like 14 seconds. And when they, they put some caching technology in the middle and they drop that down to three seconds. And so uh, these are the kinds of things that I'm hoping that we can pick apart. Interesting. Yep, and that uh, goes to the point that Daniel made about the database queries and that every time you request a package, we are querying the database and only after we get the answer from there do we serve a file. And <clears throat> this is where the caching, I think, would help is uh, once you've uh, made that request to the database, uh, providing uh, some sort of caching. And the only thing I can think of now is just writing out a symlink that a web server can serve, um, which is what Pulp2 did for as the default publish method. And that is something that could be built into the content app. Um, and it has a lot of caveats uh, to it because, you know, at some point you got to clean up those sim links also um, because things changed and the file shouldn't be there anymore. Um, but we know that a web server is really good at looking at the file system and serving static assets. Um, and yeah, I, I, I just want to point out though that I, I agree with everything you said. I just want to technically point out that um, the kernel, the reason web servers are so good at that is because they work with the kernel interfaces, which allow the kernel to provide maximally efficient binary data read and response. And what's kind of cool, what's very cool about um, white noise, which we use for our static media serving in the content app, is that it actually does the exact same thing. Um, it does have to flow through one more hop um, so I can't claim it's exactly as efficient, but the general notion that serving binary data through Python code is slow, actually, we don't have that problem. Um, and I, so I think when I hear the concerns, um, I mainly focus on the DB query. Oh, space. totally, totally. And um, so, and maybe we'll end up doing both. I think actually the idea of the sim linking and pushing that to an edge kind of a deployment would be very good. Um, I also think that uh, you should be able to use your regular pulp node and just make it very, very much faster through uh, through um, the use of DB query caching. Interesting. In terms of testing this, because that was the other half of the question I heard Daniel asking, which is, how do we, how do we, how can we? put load on pulp more easily from our end of things to try and, and flush out where the problem states are. Um, I'll just say that I know that um, Red Hat's QE has or had, had tooling in place uh, back in the day where you could spin up a container and that container would essentially mimic some number of thousands of either rel CentOS or Fedora clients. They basically implemented the, the DNF to the host, you ask for a thing and get it back communication. Mm -hmm. So if one container, you still need a big machine to run these things on, obviously, if you want to pretend to be 100,000 systems. But there's infrastructure that we can probably dig up. I don't know where that is right now, but I know it has existed and was in heavy use in the past. Um, so that might give us a leg up on being able to say, I'd like to pretend to be 10,000 clients all asking for content from Pulp without needing 10,000 VMs somewhere to make that happen. Because yeah. you don't need an out. actual system. You just need a, a piece of software. You need a process that pretends to be a machine. Yep. If we could find that, that'd be excellent. Yeah, I will. Yeah, and, uh, and the other, I have to, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I just want to counterpoint that we've been doing a lot of our scale testing on Amazon boxes themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that that pattern has been working really, really well. So if, if there's some piece of software that we could use to test it, 
I think that would be great. I think I'm a little hesitant to um, rely on the infrastructure that we had used in the past because we're we're responsible for yeah, testing no. so much these days. Yep. Well, I don't think anybody's talking about using some other infrastructure. It's a matter of uh, getting the right software to do the testing with. That sounds great. Yep, because we definitely already do testing on big boxes, and we want to continue doing that testing in those same environments. I'm also seeing some links here in the chat that are some things that we could use as well. And I've also used a project in the past called Sung. Let me look that up. I mean, what I'm hearing in response, and so this, Daniel, pardon me if I'm wrong, but you been kind of, you kind of drove this question, but what I'm hearing is a lot of support that everybody agrees this is something that we need to address. Um, and it's important. It's important for pulp. It's important for our users. And it's important for using pulp at scale, which is really where, where the whole industry is going at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think what would be really killer would be um, some testing and graphing of those tests and really having, I think there are the two graphs that are critical to produce. One is kind of akin to the C C10K problem, which is what's the response time for average response time for a thousand clients? What's the average response time for 10,000 clients and 50 and then 100,000 clients and show that graph. Um, and uh, then maybe try to make the system actually larger, like double its resources or quadruple its resources and quadruple its load and see if you can maintain a similar performance response time. Um, and then the other graph would be a, um, a, single, a single query's latency. It's a latency analysis. It uses a single query, a single client, and it looks at different hardware sizes of the uh, the um, content app, the database, and the Apache server, and tries to look at the relationship between uh, a, a single query's latency and those various sizes. And I suspect, I'm going to guess here, but I suspect or hypothesize, what I think we'll find in the latency area is that it's pretty slow relative to what we would need to do to have great latency performance and that no amount of extra hardware makes it faster. <laughs> and that uh, if you want to make it faster, then what we can do is we can look at um, caching or the sim linking option and then rerun the test. And I think we'll see, oh, man, the latency dropped significantly. And I kind of feel like this is what the Rui team has been demonstrating, only this would be like a more sciencey way of doing yeah. it. And I would love for us to you know, publish all these graphs on our blog. Yeah. Um, and just to point out one one minor thing, um, also in our content app, even though it's non nominally async, we're running synchronous I.O. in the asynchronous coroutines, which basically means we're not getting much out of yeah, you, async. So I think so I think you, I think it's possible that the latency and the throughput might be suffering. Yeah, I just want to confirm: Are you referring to the Postgres driver that we're using to do the? Uh, I'm queries? referring to the Django ORM is an async it blocks. Yeah, we're blocking inside our code routines. Yep. Yeah, and. Um... Yeah, and there may be something that we could do, but I agree with you completely, Daniel. And there may be something that we could do about that as well. It's difficult um, to make a large code base async capable around its queries. The content app is like 100 lines long. And I do believe that we could probably do something in that area as well to make it async. Yeah, we're going to write raw yeah. SQL queries. No, we're going to use what Django's already <laughs> planning to do. Actually, if we're going to write raw SQL queries, I think Grant will do it. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, I mean, honestly, the uh, the actual answer here is just use threads. That's fine. Yep. I mean, if we're at the point of just serving the content, there's really nothing that needs to be hitting database queries. 
I mean, you have an authentication layer, but that can be external. I mean, to some degree of levels, varying levels of complexity, cough, RHSM, um, but aside from that, you get to a certain point, it's like, just put it on the CPM. Yeah, I, it's it's true. And that's the other option as well, is that um, you can configure Django Storages, which Pulp uses for its storage system, uh, and it supports um, both CDNs and um, pull through cache CDNs, um, which is a different kind of CDN. So yeah, I agree, yeah. Adrian. And we should be trying to consider that as well. Yep, I was just about to say, I was just researching how Quay is always deployed. It's always deployed via, you know, on top of Kubernetes, and they can scale their Quay pods and presumably database pods up and down, but they also use object storage all the time, it looks like. That's how they perform their scalability. They don't need a caching layer at all because of object storage. Yeah, and I think that speaks to the throughput architectural stuff. And what I wonder about is what's the latency analysis? Um, what's the latency of a single request? Right, because it has to hit, hit the, it still has to hit the content server in the database. Yeah, or not if it if we had some better offering in this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be the trick is not hit the content server or the database. Right. <laughs> then it's easy. Aside from generating ra you know, randomly mutating static content, <laughs> which is hard. Yeah, and just to call it out, like why did the architecture change from Pulp 2 since since we didn't exactly have this problem in Pulp 2? And one of the reasons is that um, when you publish so much content onto a single file system, uh, a lot of file systems have symlink limits. And we ran into this problem a lot in Pulp 2. And so on the one hand, it's like, well, just why are you doing it differently? Just, just do it like everybody else does and just put it on the file system and let the web server serve it. Yeah, that creates a different kind of problem too. And so um, I think that I just wanted to call that out because that's a related issue that we did not is actually talk about. Yeah. So cool. Uh, are there any sort of next steps we want to take? I think the next steps would be to find that tooling that QE has and plan some analysis and do some analysis. Cool. Well, that sounds super say, great. Figure out what you, what skill you actually care about. It's clearly you're not going to care about scaling a million requests a second, but you probably do care about a thousand. Um, so whatever, you know, pick your metric, but you know, at some point it's just like, that's, no, you're not a customer anymore. Do something else. It's not worth the effort. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I agree. Daniel, I'll do some digging. Remind me next week. Um, because I've got to go through like six-year-old email to figure figure out who to talk to, but I'll see if I can't dig up who was involved in that, and we can we can start pursuing down those those rabbit holes. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, that's excellent. So um, that's probably a good transition into a little bit of um, kind of action items, or at least um, uh, even soft action items around it. So Daniel and Grant, sounds like you guys will collaborate on on this to get us started. Um, and Mike, going back to the Ubuntu and supporting the installer, sounds like you will um, handle starting that effort, at least writing a ticket and putting it on the installer meeting and such. Yep, exactly. Cool. Does that sound, uh, Daniel, did this section serve your um, interests and needs as the person who put the, the content onto it? Yes. I think this is a really important thing. I'm really glad that you brought this up. Uh, all right, well then, let's go on to our last uh, topic, um, which is releasing Y releases with or without, I say without, 
and we'll say with or without uh, a delay um, to allow for manual testing. Um, and uh, we had talked some about this on several threads on the mailing list. And um, I was observing that there are kind of two schools of thought in this area. And actually, I think they're both both valid, but I just wanted to put these out there and then see if we can just have a little bit of discussion, just just even not even to make a decision. I actually think every release will likely be different um, based on what's going in, what still needs to go in, and what uh, what our tolerance is to deliver later. Some some releases we just may not be able to because someone needs it by this date, so so forth. But um. But I want to just kind of see where folks are at and to have just open, unbiased uh, sharing of perspectives on it. So one of the camps uh, or beliefs, I guess, is that we have, autom I guess this is mine, we have automated tests. And so you don't get what you don't test. And uh, if we merge, after we merge things, uh, there isn't a benefit in having a delay before a Y release, which tends to be bigger. Z streams are very small, so this is really about Y releases. Um, there isn't a benefit to delay because we the automated tests uh, ran, and we're not adding more tests in that time. And uh, automated testing is our strategy. We used to have a manual testing strategy, but we don't do that anymore. Um, so that's the motivation for releasing right after the last feature is merged. Uh, to state the what I've heard from another as another perspective, which I actually think is probably equally valid, um, to be fair, is that there's a benefit to a baking period uh, after the bid releases, the bid features are merged, and you can also think of this as a testing period. And this is why people put out things like release candidates. Um, it's an opportunity for other developers and in many cases users to test the upcoming Y release and give feedback on its quality. And the concern is that if we release too quickly just after merging something large, as we did, for example, in 3.6, then uh, we will not be releasing with quality. And we could get that quality if we have some sort of a, a feature freeze or delay in release. So I'll just leave it at that's what I've heard. What are your thoughts on this matter? Can someone remind me, because I know this part of what drove this was we released 3.6 and then had to release a 3.6.1 really quickly because something happened. And I can't remember what it was because my brain is mush. Does somebody remember what that sequence was with the 3.6 release? I think I remember, correct me, otherwise, um, we definitely had to release some Z streams, 3.6.1, 3.6.2, 3.6.3, very quickly thereafter. Um, the uh, 3.6.3 was a long-term, a long-standing regression that was present even in 3.5 and earlier. And until someone actually tested it and they just happened to do it then, we didn't know about it. So that one, I don't think we would have benefited from. The other two came, uh, I think, came from, or at least 3.6.1 came from testing a pulp lift box that included the pulp two, pulp three, um, or and or Centos box. And I believe that uh, another developer used that. And so if we had waited a day or two, we would have found that problem. But to argue the, the other side of it, um, if there's a box that we know that we need, then it should be in the automated testing. And if it wasn't the automated testing, we wouldn't have had that happen to start with. Um, so as a person who kind of in a support for having a baking period, um, I can share my perspective that I completely agree that in ideal world, our goal is what you prefer, Brian. Um, it just, and I'm not sure how to assess 
this properly, like this situation. But I think there should be a certain, a certain level of test coverage when we can be sure that we can rely on it to release. And I don't think we're there yet. So I, I don't disagree, Tanya. My concern here with, well, we'll wait and have a baking period is if during that baking period, we're not doing anything different than we did right before we cut the release, then we won't find, you know, we'll do the baking period, but we're not learning anything new. Like in this particular, in the 361 instance, if nobody had been using that particular box, then we would not have found the bug. And if there had been a baking period, we still wouldn't have found the bug because nobody was using that particular scenario. If we, can we come up with, are there a set of things that we don't automate right now that we could do during this baking period, uh, short term? Long term, the answer is if they list, if that, the answer to that is yes, we need automated tests for, the, for that. We need to make that list smaller and smaller over time so that we can get to this point. I'm 50-50 yeah. I'm, I'm as to whether we're there yet. Um, I think there's important things that we don't have automated tests for yet, although I can't name any off the top of my head because there's a flamingo on it, that's, so I can't. Um, <laughs> but I think um, what I what I what I I think, and I'm just kind of struggling here uh, with where I'm, I'm trying to get with this. I guess what I'd like to see is what are the kinds of things we we want to do during a bake-in period that will make it useful at finding stuff before we unleash a release onto I've our. Got, I've got a really good idea because actually this just happened to me yesterday. Because one of the things I was imagining during this baking period, like one of the things we could do is focus on docs and have docs day during this baking period. Yesterday I was working on docs and I found two bugs while working on docs and then I just opened up PRs for it. Huh. So I think that would be really helpful if we did uh, decide to have a baking period. I just want to remind that the idea was to have a feature freeze. So okay. not to release, like we, we merge feature and then we release like the same day or next day because we usually like it's so important we need to put this into this release and so on. But if we have, I don't know, three days or like one week, we're closing other bugs. Like uh, David said, we're working on docs. We discussed that we'll have docs day uh, at this point. We can maybe write more tests. We have a huge backlog for testing. Um, and at the same time, I believe some of our stakeholders, they use nightlies. So um, they, we all use different bits and pieces throughout this week for, for, for a certain period of time, even if not a single user installs this release out there. That was the main motivation. Definitely do something and not just wait. Yep, so um, my main concern overall um, uh, isn't a blocking one in this case, I'm just calling it out just so it's out there, is that I don't, I want to avoid a situation where we start doing manual testing. Um, and no one's proposing that, so I'm just going to put that out there. Um, the challenging part about, so what you're saying, Tanya and, and David, um, I like, because what you're saying is, is that during this, it's a productive period where we're going to take action to get more than we got before, because one of my main beliefs is that if we run the automated tests and we don't do anything during the baking period, then we're not benefiting from it. But what you're saying sounds like pretty good. Um, the I want to call out a paradox, though, that's present in this plan. And I don't know what to do about it. And that's why that's the only reason I'm saying it. So pulp tends to be under the gun, right? Because someone needs something and they need it now. So it becomes difficult for us to justify that we haven't released something. Why? Because we're waiting. Uh, that's a dip, that's uh, when days matter and sometimes even cases hours matter. Um, that becomes a difficult thing, and so what ends up happening is, and here's the paradox: um, we're under the gun to deliver something, and so we're working like crazy to finish that last feature, and yet the stakeholder can't afford a delay, and so here's the paradox: is so the solution to that is that I need to deliver my feature earlier. Oh, wait, I'm already working like mad to deliver it. We've just made a hard problem worse. And I don't know what to do about that. 
I will give you a counter argument to this paradox. Good. <laughs> Uh, so I hear on that that we are under the gun. However, um, once we release uh, without having this baking period, there is a really high chance that there will be bugs there, right? So even if you give this release to the stakeholder who is on fire, there is a higher chance that it will be unusable. As a consequence, we'll need to spend more FTs from our side to make another Z-release SAP. How many times we've been in this uh, boat? A lot lately. So as a counter argument, like waiting, I don't know, I don't wanna uh, say specific days, but let's say a couple of days where we call them as a feature freeze. And meanwhile, we'll work on docs. And as David mentioned, like he discovered those bugs. And if it's an easy fix, we'll manage to get them into the release in this way will decrease these chances of delivering, delivering super buggy release just because we managed to smuggle in uh, the um, latest feature and release right after. Yeah, also like, what does it mean when the stakeholder needs the release? Like if we do a beta release at the beginning of the baking period, can they start to use that and test it out before we do the actual yeah. release? And then maybe we have a higher quality release? And, and I think I, I agree. That's a great question. And so I don't believe that the answer is that they can, but don't take my word for it. Um, one of the drivers for the September 22nd delivery, which is a date we agreed on a long time ago, but a lot of people have built their schedules and workflows around that date, right? And we couldn't deliver the features that need to go in it any sooner. So I don't think we could have the baking period start any sooner. So that puts us up against uh, under the gun again. So um, the question for Galaxy and G, for example, I see David Neuswinger and Adrian on the call. Um, kind of two questions. Uh, is delaying, you know, what would a delay in, if, uh, if we didn't deliver Pulp Core 3.7 on September 22nd and we delivered it three days or a week later, would that, how would that affect you? And the other question would be, if we said that we were feature complete and had a nightly, would you use it? in that period? Uh, well, specifically for the uh, September 22 release, if that was delayed a week, we'd probably have to push back our, our um, RC release. Uh, but I, I think it would be useful to have a uh, nightly build and uh, some time to test things out before they're released. Uh, we, we have had trouble with the, some of the things that Ina is mentioning where uh, we get a release and it's uh, fairly buggy and we then have to come back to you guys and put more pressure on you guys and work around the bugs and stuff like that. So, yeah. So my, qu what I wonder is <clears throat> what difference does it make uh, calling something a 370GA and uh, calling it a 370 release candidate or beta. And uh, is there a difference? Because I feel like as a user of software, whenever I see a .o release, I expect bugs in it. <clears throat> and I expect to have to upgrade to the .1, .2, whatever comes out later. and. I, I'm conflicted myself as to do we do these, you know, release candidate or beta releases, or do we just release a .o knowing that we will need to release a ZStream app? I think it mostly just depends on if there's tooling that will that will that's going to update to to 3.7.0 automatically. If there is. Yeah, maybe you'd be a little more careful, but if it's not and no one's doing that, yeah, then it's not. It's pretty meaningless distinction. Dennis, I think as our tooling for doing the, the Z releases gets more and more automatic and takes less and less time, that's it's a lot easier because part of that discussion is, okay, we release 3.x and then we release an x.1, .2, .3, .4, 
over the course of the next three days. Do you really want to cut four more releases over three days right now today? Probably not, just from our own sanity's sake. But if I could cut a new release by simply pushing a button somewhere and having 90% of the release processing happen automatically, then it becomes a lot easier for us to say, we're going to fix it and you'll get a new one. You'll get, and it'll happen four hours after the last one. And I don't feel like I'm stressed or that I'm requiring somebody else on the team to be horribly stressed to try and get that out. Um, I will say that the, the, the last minute, oh my God, oh, this thing that you thought you had more time for actually has to come in a week or a month earlier, or, or you thought you had everything done, but we just gave you a bunch of new requirements, but you can't move the date. Those are anti-patterns, and I know we're always going to have them, but I would hesitate to drive our entire release process on that. And because that, that we need to, as a team for the quality of the product and the sanity of not just us, but our stakeholders have to be able to push back on, look, you've got to think in advance because you don't want what happens. You, our stakeholders, do not want what happens when we try and put a major new feature into place in three days. Trust me. So um, I'll just throw that out there. Um, I would like to comment on what Dennis said earlier. Uh, sharing my perception about the RC beta in GA, like um, when I look at those tags, I definitely expect bugs uh, for RC, less for RC, more for beta. But if it's a GA, I have an expectation that if I install that build, it's ready for production. And in case we decide to go down that path, then I'm pretty sure we'll need to adapt all the dev freeze, feature freeze, and all the freezes milestones, which will be part of the release process. So um, uh, in a way, the my, my beliefs on this matter come down to a different question. And the question that I keep asking myself is, uh, if we had a baking period, would people actually test it? And if the answer to that is yes, then I would say I'm in favor of it. If the answer to that is no, then I think I'm not in favor of it. Um, and so, cause we know more testing results in better software. So really the goal should, it's not even necessarily about a baking period. I think it's what are our strategies to have our software more tested and better tested earlier? And well, that, that brings me to another point, which is um, if we're unsure of features that we're committing, then we're not providing adequate testing for that feature. And it would be, we would do better and our users and stakeholders would do better to have fewer features that were more high quality delivered with tests. And we shouldn't be merging things that we're unsure of. And we shouldn't right. probably be, be releasing features that we're not testing. Well, if it's not if it's not tested in my mind, if it's not tested, it's not a feature. Like we can't <laughs> promise that we have a feature if we're not testing it. Well, we do Is test it a... to a certain extent while we review the PRs, while we write the docs, if we write them in a timely manner. It, yeah, but it's... basically I think Douglas would please. I, I was just going to ask, is there a difference between new features being introduced and breakage of existing features and taking a slightly different tack where new features were introduced, but a bit like um, RHEL does with IPA when it was originally introduced as a tech preview. You introduce something as a tech preview for those that are very keen to adopt it and they can adopt it, um, but it is with the, with the, the notion that it's a tech preview. Um, my my concern would be um, any new feature that broke existing functionality, um, making it into a GA. I know personally, I'm um, with you on. I always expect a dot one, dot two, dot three, and when you're in production, you tend not to adopt something until it hits a dot one, dot two, dot three. Just as we, I would never go to Red Hat eight. Um, until it's 8.1 or 8.2. It, it's just it's just the nature of the beast. So it, uh, is there a difference between new features, which could be considered tech preview, um, v's breakage of existing um, functionality? Yeah. Yep. 
That's a really useful uh, separation. Thanks. So and I just want to call a time uh, time check. So we have just a few more minutes. Justin, please. Sure. Yeah, you were talking about. I'm um, sorry, I came in kind of late. We were talking about I think betas and whether anyone would be able to test them. Um, I think from our from the Catella side, we could definitely commit to a certain level of testing, which would most likely just catch, you know, regressions with things. We we tend to hit those a lot with the bindings um, or other kind of obscure areas. I think that if a beta was released, we could definitely do a certain level of testing, which would basically be upgrading like our dev workstation and running those integration tests. Uh, we definitely have a harder time when it comes to running the full nightly pipelines that we have because those tend to require RPM builds and are a lot more difficult um, to do that with. But I, I would definitely like to see us improve our ability to test prior to a release so that we don't hit things where we have to have Z, immediate Z streams to fix bindings that have been broken. Ideally, we would be testing nightlies or on a nightly basis, but it's just really hard due to the fact that our night, our existing nightlies, you know, run from RPMs. And Justin, I, I think you're basically calling out the, the name of the game. Um, which is, I don't think it, this debate, while it's interesting about whether we change our process or not, I think it's significantly more productive to focus on making sure that as many people are testing our software as, as they can. And if we, I think, are purposeful and intentional about making sure that night heats, literally every night, that they're somehow upgraded into the Catel environment and to the extent that we can run the full pipeline on it, that would be excellent. And similarly for Galaxy and G. I tell people that they should have their CI use master. And that way, before we release, they they know um, what they're getting. That's not practical in a lot of cases. And so don't do it. But the strategy is the same, which is more testing earlier produces better software. Yep. I think uh, we are pretty much at our time. For yes, I agree. Session. Um, um, I'd like to have a quick comment about the being of, under the gun and um, all these things. Um, just to remind you that all these discussions started also with regards to stress levels and everyone. And um, I kind of encourage people not to forget about it, especially at current times. Um, and I think working with the, with the projects which rely on us is a partnership. So um, we kind of need to agree how we collaborate so no one is under the gun. They are willing to test early and uh, we try to deliver, I don't know, plan, plan dates better. And all, it's very often that something urgent happens, but if it becomes on a regular basis, there is something wrong and it needs to be changed. Um, very well said, Tanya. I agree. Is it time for the closing ceremonies? I believe it is time for the closing ceremonies. As traditional among our people at PulpCon. <laughs> yes. On Friday at PulpCon. On Friday at PulpCon. I don't know. Is this is this able to be heard? I don't know. I bet it will be. Do you yeah, want to I share your screen? Like I punked him to like bring him in just for this. <laughs> well, that's a good point. I've never actually tried to share audio in Google Meet before. I don't know. Honey, is, is, it working? Your, is it your uh, repeat hat? Uh, <laughs> don't don't remind to anyone. No. <laughs> um, no, it's not working, Brian. <laughs> How about now? Is it working now? You got maybe. Yeah, I don't know. No, I'm not hearing whatever you're trying to. Bro I'll tell you what, you might have to put it on your phone, and then yeah, hold it up your mic. I agree. Well, we'll try that, and that'll I mean, be fine. We'll try that here in a minute. There, 
This would not be a tech meeting, video meeting, without there being a tech problem. It's what happens. So, also, I if agree. you're streaming, if you're streaming this to YouTube, be aware you may get a copyright claim, <laughs> depending on what. Yeah, you guys that's play. that's that's uh, that's no problem. I'll, we'll we'll take that hit. Well, we're not we're not trying to monetize, so I think we're okay. Yeah, we can just. <laughs>